Okay, let's introduce our panel. I'm going to ramble on for a little bit. Dr. Luis Torres, PhD, uh, he received his bachelor's degree in economics from the Monterey Institute of Technology in Mexico. He received a master's in economics from the University of Texas at El Paso, where his dissertation received honors. He later earned a, a scholarship to participate in the American Economic Association PhD program, summer minority program. His PhD is from the University of Colorado at Boulder, where he specialized in interna international economics in eco metrics. During his doctoral studies, he worked at the El Paso branch of the Dallas Federal Reserve. From 1995 to 2012, he was with the Blanco de Mexico in the research department and the institutional liaison department. As for more than 15 years, he has central banking experience. Dr. Torres has taught classes and seminars at U.S. and Mexican universities as well as national and international forums. He has published various articles in academic and non-academic publications about banking, international economics, trade, and applied ecometrics. Please welcome Dr. Torres. <laughs> Who wants to go after that one? <laughs> okay, Mitch Creedmore, Creekmore has been with Stewart Title since 1994. He is a licensed real estate broker and has a CIPS with over 30 years of commercial and residential real estate experience. Creekmore has written more than 35 articles on international realty and co-authored two books entitled Cashing In on the Second Home in Mexico and Cashing In on a Second Home in Central America. He is a member of the International Advisory Groups for the Arizona-Mexico Commission, the Texas Association of Realtors, and the Houston Association of Realtors, as well as a member of the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo International Committee's management team. Please welcome Mitch to the stage. <laughs> Next, Bill Hamilton. Bill grew up in Austin and attended local schools, graduating from the University of Texas with a bachelor's degree in administration and accounting. Bill then earned his CPA, Certified Public Accountant, designation in 1978. Bill has spent most of his career in public accounting serving, serving clients. He expanded his financial service offerings with the extension of his firm, Hamilton Wealth Management, in 2009. He also spent many years participating in local civic and charitable organizations in an effort to give back to his community. Bill has a real passion for delivering world-class service to his clients, Bill truly believes that his clients are more than just his clients, they are his friends. As such, he believes in fairness and reliability in all business matters in which he and his firms are involved. He considers himself very fortunate to have the privilege of working with his talented teams at both W. Hamilton and Company and Hamilton Wealth Management on a day-to-day -day basis. Please welcome Bill to the panel. And, uh, Puyas Sethi is an immigration attorney and managed partner of law offices of Puyas Sethi, PLLC, Asian American Quality of Life Council City Commissioner, founder and president of the charity South Asian Austin Moms, and a selected leader with a heart from the American Heart Association Policy Academy. She is also selected by Mayor Steve Adler with other city leaders to be on the Mayor's Task Force of Institutional Racism and Systematic Inequalities, drafting the report that is on the City of Austin's homepage and utilized by all city departments. Please welcome uh, uh, Puya. <laughs> and last but not least, David Kirkenbach is an international uh, program coordinator in the Global Business Expansion Division for the City of Austin Economic Development Department. His work includes assisting local businesses in their expansion efforts to international markets and coordinating international initiatives that benefit the local community. David is a military veteran with experience in strategic planning and business performance management. While serving in the military, he worked in linguistics and collaborate, collaborated with a magnitude of international governments and organizations. David first studied communications before beginning his graduate work in business administration. With over 10 years of global development efforts and a unique background, David is versed in creating long-term meaningful relationships that span into foreign countries. Please welcome David to the panel. Okay, Dr. Torres, all yours. So, uh, 
So, good morning, and like we say, College Station, howdy. Uh, first, I want to thank Shirley Williams and her team for doing such a great uh, uh, work, job, organizing this event. It's great to be here. I think we have a great panel. Uh, she, she formed a great panel, so we're going to have a great discussion today. So, in my, the first part of it is I'm going to talk, give a little small presentation. I'm going to talk about the outlook for the Austin economy basically, the economic trends, the housing market. Then I'll talk about international home buying, and at the end I'll have some concluding remarks. So how is the, how is the Austin economy doing? Well, overall, the Austin economy continues to expand. Good news. What am I showing you here? It's a graph with employment growth rates. I have in the graph, I have the U.S. is in blue, Texas is in red, and of course, Austin is in orange, right? So. If you look at that little, at that orange line right there, that's uh, quarterly growth rates, uh, total employment growth uh, compared. Look at that orange line. Look at uh, after you know we had uh, the financial crisis, the Great Recession. That's the blue shaded re uh, square right there, rectangular right there. Look at that orange line. Isn't that beautiful? Look at how it's always above the red and the blue line. What is that showing us? That's showing us that growth in Austin was higher, employment growth economic growth also, you can argue that also, is higher than in Texas and in, and in, the, in the U.S. But look at that, that last part right there uh, at the end of that, that little like hook on, the, on the, red, the red line, you see kind of a slowing down. So after achieving long run uh, sustainable, uh, strong growth here in Austin, we're kind of slowing down. The Austin economy is slowing down a little bit. But still, you know, the growth rates are impressive for, for Austin. And why is Austin seemingly kind of slowing down? Well, the, one of the major reasons, one of the major interests here in Austin is technology. Don't forget that, let me show you, uh, technological jobs have, have slowed down. Uh, don't forget that after the financial crisis, what happened after the financial crisis? We learned really interesting things about the U.S. economy. Cities where you have technology and energy recovered faster and did much better than the rest of the country. Examples, Austin and Houston, right? Of course, then we had the oil bust in, the oil bust in 2014. What happened to Houston? The Houston economy slowed down. Now it's picking up, now their oil prices are up. But Austin maintained that positive growth all through that oil bust. So Austin has been doing really well. So what I'm showing you here is all the technological jobs here in Austin. We have telecommunications, computer manufacturing, other professional business services, IT professional services. And if you look at those lines, look what's happening at the end. Especially manufacturing jobs, technical jobs have slowed down. And also telecommunications service jobs have slowed down. So that's kind of affecting the slowdown in, in, in growth, in employment growth here in Austin. Now, let's move forward. So we have talked about jobs. The important part of it is, is wages also. Part of the story is also. So wait, so just to show you another, before I move to wages, I just wanted to show you that the employment growth has been broad for the whole, for the whole Austin economy. Look at the different sectors, and you're going to want to, you, what you're going to look at first is positive growth for all broad employment, manufacturing, services, transportation, to, uh, trade. So overall, positive news for uh, the Austin economy. Now. What's been the major story that we hear every week, you know, in the business, business economy is this, yes, we've had strong growth in the U.S. economy, Texas economy, but it hasn't been accompanied, accompanied by wage growth, right? But look at the case of Austin. What I'm showing you here again is blue line is going to be U.S., red Texas, and orange is going to be Austin. Uh, these are hourly earnings year over year, so it's actually wage growth. And look at that beautiful orange line. Look at that growth rate in, in wages here in Austin. So that shows you, yes, you know, it's not, you know, compared to the U.S., compared to Texas, wage growth has been really positive here in Austin. What we see at the end, you know, at that, at that, after that incredible, uh, beautiful uh, wage growth in Austin, at the end you see kind of slow down. And then I put a little table there where I compare wage growth, average wages, you know, uh, uh, to Texas and the U.S., and you can see how wages paid here in the city, in the MSA of Austin, are much higher than U.S. and Texas. Well, that shows you why. Why is this? Because technology. Technology is a major industry here in Austin, and that's allowed Austin, 
what? To, ha to achieve higher incomes, higher wage growth than versus, you know, Texas and the U.S. Now, what's going to look? What's the outlook coming forward for, for Texas, for, for Austin, for the U.S. economy? What I'm showing you here again is an outlook survey. What is this survey? It's a business survey. It's a really good indicator of what's going to happen in the future. They actually go out and ask businesses, actual businesses, actual companies, what do you think about the future coming forward? Do you think it's going to be positive? Or do you think it gets negative? And it's really easy to, to, to understand the graph. If you're above the zero, you would expand. If you're below the zero, you're, in, you're contracting. The economy is contracting. So look at the case of, 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 of Texas and, and Austin, Texas manufacturing, I think services I can see from here. But you can see that positive, that positive line, meaning, yes, the outlook is still positive for Texas, for Austin, and for the US. So good news, still positive. I don't know what's going to happen. The major issue is going forward. You know, 2018 looks good. 2019 looks good. 2020, I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen because that's another story. There are a lot of issues coming forward for the U.S. economy. 2020, one major issue is the fiscal stimulus supposedly is going to end by 2020. So when that ends, there's a lot of uncertainty. The uh, former Chairman Bernanke from the Federal Reserve Bank, he was recently in Australia, and I found it interesting that he never makes jokes. You know, he's a typical central banker. He rarely makes comments or, you know, and he's, he kind of made an interesting comment there. He was saying for the U.S. economy, he says, 20, 2020 could be a Wiley e. Coyote moment for the U.S. economy. So remember the Wiley e. Coyote cartoon? We have the rockets. Well, right now we have the rocket on our back, right? Shh. And 2020, maybe the rocket's going to end and something can happen, you know? Another thing that's been big in the news is the inverted yield curve. It hasn't inverted yet. What is the inverted yield curve? That's when uh, short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. As you know, long-term rates should be higher than short-term rates because of the risk, the time premium. So it hasn't inverted, but the yield curve for the last past recessions has shown us that the U.S. economy, when the yield curve inverts, turns negative, when short-term rates are higher than long-term rates, for the last, time, for the last seven recessions, we've, the U.S. economy has, has entered a, a, a recession. Now, the thing with the yield curve is such a good leading indicator that it has a one-year lead. So what normally happens is when the yield curve inverts, people don't take it seriously. They always say, oh my god, no, this is not this time. Not this time, because when it inverts, the economy is doing well. But it happens in a year. So yeah, if you're more interested in that, I did a little uh, uh, article, I did a blog on the yield curve inverting, if you're more interested in knowing what's happening there. So let's go to the housing market here in Austin. So the big issue has been after the recovery. What's the big issue? You know this better than I do, has been the housing supply. Here I'm showing you single family permits. It's interesting that still here in Austin, with the, such a hot market, such a hot economy, we still haven't achieved levels, pre-crisis levels of single family permits or home construction. We're still below Austin, below 2007 levels. Look at that peak. You look at that peak right there, 2007, first month. And look where we are right now. We're like a 90, and it was 100. We're still below uh, supply side. So that's been the major story. You, you have realtors now, low months of inventory. What's happening? We're not building the sufficient houses. Something happened after the financial crisis. What happened? The bill of lots. Lands. I'm going to show you now supply of the bill of lots, especially for lots. So this is really important because if there are no lots, to, if there are no lots available, you're not going to be able to build a new home, right? So imagine like a production, like you have, you have the inputs, you're not going to produce a, an iPhone or, or, or any product. The same here for home building, new home construction. If you don't have lots, you're not going to be able to build a home. So going to what's happening in Texas. Uh, Texas has been known for its housing affordability, right? Compared to Advantage, people move here. Yes, we're relatively more, more, more affordable than the rest of the country, but we're losing that. Look at the blue line. Those are lots. Uh, for building homes below a price tag of $200,000. What happened to the blue line for Austin? It's down, and it's still it's flat. Is it coming up? Probably not. I've heard people from, uh, especially from Metro Study, telling me, you know what, it's going away. It's a rarity that that $200,000 home here in Texas is practically boop, going away, vanishing, right? With that growth, we have achieved in Texas, Austin, Houston, Dallas, now we see in Dallas also, uh, San Antonio, 
we're losing that, no? So this is really important. It shows you the picture how the supply side has been constrained with that strong demand, right? And if you look at the lots, every other lot you've seen that's come up, home builders have lots there to build for, other, for the other different price tags, tags of homes, right? Now, sales, that's a big issue. I think it's been a news. I think you've been asking, I've been asking people before that. It's been a news, we're, we're watching this. Uh, Dallas Burning News called us the other day because Trulia came out with a report on what's happening with uh, inventory supposedly have increased and sales are slowing down. Of course, months of inventory, as you know, you're there in the market, you see the data every day, you sell the houses, you know that months of inventory are still really low. There's not a supply of homes available right now, especially if you're looking for a home with a price tag below $300,000. So here, our argument still, that little, again, Austin is going to be the the orange line, the little hook, the hook sign, the decline at the end of the of that graph, it shows you that slowdown in sales. But our argument still is based on days of market, months of inventory, that is due to the lack of inventory. We still haven't seen that slowing down in demand. Maybe with the higher price price tags, but with the slowdowns, as you know, it's still strong. People still want to buy a home, especially if it's with a price tag below three hundred thousand dollars, and it's really difficult to find one. So, hosting sales for by, by price cohort. Look what's happening here, right? You know, the blue line again is $200,000 homes, uh, price tax below $200,000. Yes, they're really low because people want to buy them. The problem is there's no homes available for $200,000. This is Austin, by the way. I'm showing you all, all, all Austin here. So again, you see that hook line. You see that little hook for the rest of the price, price cohorts also, especially for the yellow one, for the more expensive one. But yeah, there's a little slowdown here in sales. And our argument still is the lack of months of inventory. So let's move on. Again, the argument here, months of inventory for lowest price course are declining. We have still record lowest months of inventory. They're below almost three, almost around three months of inventory, really low. I know uh, who, who did a big thing, Julia did a big thing because they increased, they did the percentage wise, you know, to get the big headline. Oh, uh, months of inventory increased by 40%. Of course, if you go from 2.3 to 2.8, right? You're not going back. I would, be, I would be kind of worrisome, it would be kind of worrisome if we went from 2.9 to 5 months of inventory right, or six, then that would show you that the market is slowing down. But still, months of inventory are still low, as you can see, right? And that data is up to, up to June, by the way. So simple, if I, I can give you the answer, before I, I, I jump to the next slide, principles of micro, principles of economics, guys. What happens when you have constrained supply and strong demand? What happened to the prices? Exactly, what's happened to Austin prices? Look at the Austin prices. This is a repeat sales index. Look at the first quarter of 2007. That's 100, right? Look all the way, it's risen all the way. It's about an 80% rise in housing prices here in Austin alone. It, it, it beats Texas, it beats the US, right? The US is another, another animal right there. But look at the price, the median price. Austin has registered the highest uh, median prices than the rest of the four major MSAs. So that's a huge increase, 80% increase in 11 years uh, here in, in, in the Austin MSA. So that's an impressive, showing you the strength of the market still, right? Uh, and by the way, just a little plug there from the Real Estate Center, we're gonna come up with our own repeat sales index. We're gonna publish that uh, later on. So we're gonna have our own pub uh, for Austin, for Dallas, for uh, Houston, for San Antonio. We're gonna have our own repeat sales index better than the Case Shiller index that's published and only has Dallas included, we're gonna have one for Austin. So we're coming up with new products also to measure what's happening here in the Mahasi market in Texas. Now, so what's happening now? I kind of showed you wages, yes, are growing a lot here in Austin because of technology, but overall what's been the issue here? Prices are risen, uh, are risen at, a, at a very high rate, but the major problem here is that income hasn't kept up with price increases. I didn't bring it with me, but I have a really cool graph where I, where I show, compare, all the way back to the 70s, 70s, I think about 70s. Housing prices and, inc and disposable income here in Texas. Disposable income in Texas always rise at a higher level here in Texas than housing prices. But after, 2000, after 2012, that changed. Housing prices are rising at a higher rate than income levels here in the state of Texas. So it's going back to what I said earlier, we're losing that competitive advantage here in Texas. And of course, what happens? Then you have affordability issue here. This is our affordability index. 
we're still more affordable than the, the Austin is still, still affordable, but you know we have seen the decline, right, in affordability. Here I have the, the four major MSAs. Uh, Dallas is less because of the, 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 rise, the recent rise in, 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 in housing prices have affected more the, the affordability and because, you know, income hasn't rise that faster. So th that shows you that the price we're paying for that growth, right? Yes, income prices are, up, prices are going at a higher rate, but the problem is income is not keeping up with, with, those, with those prices and it's affecting affordability. Now let's talk about international home buying. So what's happening in the market? So simple, I, I like this graph. This graph tells you everything. You know, you have, I'm showing you world GDP growth, world income growth, and I'm showing you purchases by foreigners in the US. Look at the little relationship, it's straightforward. When the little red line goes down, that's world GDP, I can see from here, yeah. When that little red line goes down, the, those blue boxes go down. When it goes up, the blue boxes go down. What is he telling you? When the rest of the world is doing well, when the world is doing well, there are gonna be more foreign purchases here in the US, as simple as that. So, increase when positive global growth momentum increased, even when facing, it's interesting, even when you know we had all this uncertainty because of the anti-globalization, the big nationalization, the, the, the trends right now about against globalization, international trade, a certainty of great, great immigration here in the US, you still had that positive increase when the world GDP increased. So there's still that strong relationship with that. So one of the top countries, China is still has the top country. Here we have well, the top five, you know this, is China, India, England, Mexico, in Canada, of course. So these are the top countries. You've seen that growth in, in China. Uh, so Ch China has to, continues to be the top foreign buyer. And they pay the highest price for home. So these are the prices per home for the top economy currents, except for Mexico, that's a different issue, but they pay a higher price. There I showed you, Aust I have uh, the price per purchase by country, right? And you see right over China is the highest one. And I compare it to Austin uh, uh, prices, US, Texas, right? Now, what are the four states that make up the majority of the foreign purchases? Well, of course, Texas is one of them. It's uh, Texas, uh, and, and interesting for Texas, it's increased uh, through, the, through the years, right? If you look at Texas, you see that the green, the blue, then the purple line. Sorry, I can't see from here. And then you have the other, you have the other states. Now, good stat, this one. One in 10 homes purchased by international buyers were purchased in Texas. So uh, approximately like 30, 40, 34,000 homes were purchased in Texas by foreigners with a value of $8.4 billion. So that's a lot. Uh, how do we rank? You know, if I country, you know, Mexico's would be number one. I can't see from here, sorry. Uh, China's, I think we're, th China we're third. Canada, the, we have all the rankings by, by country, the preference of your for foreign purchases here in the state of Texas. Now, what do you represent of the total sales still in Texas? Bless you. Uh, Home purchases by international uh, buyers represent about 10% of sales in Texas and about 20% of the market value here in Texas. <laughs> Paying a much higher price, I put prices here, average price, they, play, they pay about two point times higher price than the price here in Texas, the average price pays in Texas. So that's impressive also. Yes, I, the new stats, I don't have the new stats. So, strong immigration. This is a really cool stat, I know you know this. But almost one in 10 people who might who immigrate to the US, where they move to? They move to Texas. One in 10 people. Of all the 10 people that migrated to, to the US, immigrated to the US, one of those 10 people moved to Texas. And we're here we have the top of the states. Austin will be the third. Houston is number one. Dallas second because of the, of the, of the size of the city, the industry also, right? Now, some concluding remarks. So in the short run, uh, we see a, a broader and stronger global growth environment. So the projections, going back to what I was saying earlier, we, uh, the global economy will continue to grow in 2018, 2019. So it's a positive uh, outlook right now. 2019, let's see. But basically what I said earlier is that if the world economy is doing well, foreign purchases are gonna do well. If we don't, you know, start or imp implement barriers to entry to the country. That's another thing, if policy changes. But if everything stays the same, like we economists like to say, other things equal, we see a positive outlook going forward, right? 
if uh, China, especially India, maintain their growth rates, they have the potential to increase the number of foreign purchases. Now, going forward, China and India is interesting. Uh, I know you know this, Steve knows this because I was there in Dallas, but China and India have an issue going forward. There's more f males than females. Why is that? Their population is different. Why? The one China policy and the preferences for male children. So that affected nature there. And nature is wise. Nature always gives you any specimen, especially human specimen, gives you more females than males. But China has a big issue going forward. There are more males than females. So that can affect, we see that's that, how that works out. But that's a, that, that's a reality. Uh, the linkages between Mexico and, and, uh, and the U.S. and especially Texas, right, uh, are strong. So that will make it an important market of foreign buyers. Canada, of course, the same thing. Now, Canada has another issue is that housing prices are going crazy in Canada. I know you follow the Canadian market, but it's crazy. A lot of people for the past two or three years have said that there's a bubble in Canada. So talking about affordability, compared to Canada prices, we're still more affordable, right? And of course, the economic linkages with, with Canada. Now, headwinds, we've seen this. Tightening financial conditions, interest rates are gonna go up, inflation is going up. Infl if inflation goes up, nominal interest rates go up. So that's happening, you know. Uh, popular support for global environment. Unfortunately, right now, I'm, like you heard earlier, I'm an international guy. I believe in trade, I believe in globalization, I believe in the benefits for every country that's doing it. Of course, I do believe in fair trade also, but overall, it's been good. Immigration, trade has been good for every economy in the world. It benefits you. And fortunately, right now, the rhetoric is against globalization and trade. So that could have, be, have a negative headwind for going forward. Trade tensions, right? Today, President Trump is meeting with the, with the European Union Committee. And you heard that. And they're going to talk about cars. So I hope they don't put chance. I want to buy a new car. Our family's trying to buy a new car coming up in the fall. I hope he doesn't implement tariffs on cars because that's going to hurt us. We've seen a couple of weeks ago, you know, Whipple was happy, happy initially with the tariffs, but then now, now they're not that happy because prices of, 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 of washing machines and, and dryers are going up right now, right? So we've seen this. It's starting to go. So it's a negative. So those are the things we have to look out for, right? And of course, of course, you know, the immigration policy, you know, the image we have, maybe not positive towards immigrants. We have to, because it's an image thing, right? So it could be a possible negative. But overall, overall, the U.S. and Texas, it's attractive to live here. It's attractive. You know, we still have a lot of things going for us. We have the world economy here, private property rights like any other place in the country, quality of life, security, right? So, and also Texas. We have energy, Houston. We have technology here in Austin. So the, all of those are good things, favorable business conditions, low regulation, pro-business, low taxes. All of that makes it attractive for the rest of the world, also housing affordability. So we have all these things going forward, forward us, and I see that positive still maintaining. Structurally, we haven't changed. The tariff barriers, you know, that could have a negative effect. Uh, Anti-globalization sentiment, that can change, but still positive outlook for, 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 for the U.S. and for Texas, especially to attract foreign investment here in the country and the state and the city of Austin. Okay. And before I move on to the panel, just a little promo. I recommend you to visit our webpage. All information is free. We have a housing report. We have the report for the major MSAs. We're going to have the repeat sales. And also, we're coming up with a cool quality report in commercial real estate. So that's going to be cool also. So we have a lot of stuff going for us at the center. Well, thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I didn't bore you too much with that econ. And then we're going to do uh, the, the panel. So now it's, it's my time to get out of the way. And here we have this, this, great, panel, this great panel. So let me start then. Let me start with the panel discussions. So well, let's welcome again Pooja. Welcome. Welcome. David, thank Michael, you. and Bill. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be here in this panel and having an opportunity to talk about this, this, issue, this issue, especially for foreign buyers, especially your expertise. So let's start with David. David. Great. You kind of mentioned to me that, you know, uh, approximately 151 people 
a day moved to Austin. That's impressive, don't you think? I don't know if people moved to Boston a day. And this number is slightly lower than the past. Yeah, but still a large influx. Uh, why do, do, what do you attribute as, as to why so many are choosing to make Austin their home? Well, first off, I just want to say thank you for everybody who organized this, and it's an honor to be a part of this even. So it's a great event, and thank you. Uh, so I think the quick and easy answer, obviously, is going to be the, the quality of life that we really see here in Austin. It's, it's a combination of the events and the type of, the, just the type of focus that happens here in Austin from all these major international events. When you look at the South by Southwest, the ACLs, Formula One, even the Austin Marathon pulls in. I think they had about like 350 international runners registered last year. So it's these surprising events that are, are drawing this whole global focus here and it's bringing people to Austin. When you couple that with the cost and you couple that, I mean, in comparison, Austin's affordable. Like if you look at a $300,000 house here in Austin and you compare that to the same, a similar house in Denver, you're looking at a significant increase in the price there. So people are coming here. Uh, there's, I know you, there was mention of things slowing down, but internationally, uh, I think Austin is just starting to become really known. Everybody thinks when you come to the U.S., it's East Coast, West Coast, right? That is the extent of the United States of America. But we are strategically positioned to be centrally located, which offers just a huge benefit. I mean, you can, it's distri distribution, access to a ton of different markets that are all very close by. It's, it's just starting to really, because of that quality of life and the things that are unique to Austin, is we're starting to become more and more of that international hub. So, so what trends are you seeing? What, what, what is the investment coming from? Where are these businesses coming here from? So it's, I mean, it is all over, really. Uh, a lot of it is... Is that all just technology? Do you have it's, more? Well, yeah, I mean, we do have quite a technology scene here, if you didn't know. But there's, I mean, it's everything. And it's, it's governments, too, that are trying to make these connections. I mean, just for an example, so uh, Monday we met with the mayor of Eindhoven from the Netherlands. Uh, tomorrow I'm meeting with the city manager from Limerick, Ireland. There's a delegation with the joint secretary from India here. It's, I mean, the list goes on. I met the Peruvian Congress members were here last week. It's, so there's all these different trends that are, that are coming, and they're all looking towards Austin. But it's really, it's a, it's a full-on global thing that I see from my perspective, at least in the Economic Development Department, is that it's, it's all over. Everybody is just starting to learn about Austin, and they are all starting to flood to the scene. Great. Let's move on to Puja. Talk about the hot subject that's been here for a long time, immigration, right? So first of all, you know, is the immigration process getting more, diffi is more difficult for a legal immigrant wanting to migrate to the U.S.? Is it more lengthy? Is it harder? Is it more difficult? Is it, or is it basically the same? She's like. <laughs> so I'll, I'll start with saying thank you for having me here. And um, gosh, how much time do you have? <laughs> um, is, is the immigration process more difficult? We, we've all read it in the news. Of course it is. It's. Um, you know, for at every level of, of the game, it's not just the undocumented that are having a hard time that, that we're reading about, but also H-1Bs. I mean, there was just a memo that came out two weeks ago that makes it very difficult for H-1Bs, um, which if, if you guys don't know what an H-1B is, um, get to know it, because we're in Austin and this is a tech city. And I'm sure many of you have clients who are, who are um, H-1Bs. Um, but it's, it's the visa for the highly skilled workers, uh, many of the tech companies, here in Austin, Dell, I know Google's here, or, you know, all these tech companies, um, they, they hire the H-1Bs and they, they come here and it's the highly skilled workers and you have to have, you know, a master's degree, you know, typically engineering, computer science degrees and, um, and obviously it's a big amount in Austin because, you know, they're calling this the next Silicon Valley. So, you know, yes. H-1Bs are coming. They're great. Um, in the past, historically, um, in Silicon Valley, you know, H-1Bs moving into Silicon Valley has actually showed to raise up the property values, you know, make the schools better, and it's just been a positive impact on the economy there. So seeing how Austin is the next Silicon Valley, um, it's really important that we keep our eye on the ball of what's going on with immigration. So memos that came out two weeks ago that say if there's any kind of mistake on an H-1B application, um, they're going to get, they could be potentially get um, immediate deportation or notice to appear, which means they have to go back to their country and then reapply again, which is, is you know, something that could take years. So it is very difficult. The backlog right now for H-1Bs from some of the major countries that were mentioned, which are China and India, are between um, 15 to 20 years to even get a green card. So. Um, 
It is, it is very difficult. It's, it's getting more difficult, which I think is personal. I personally think is going to really affect the Austin economy. So uh, I was going to ask you that. I wasn't going to be a question, though, no. about the type of, of types of visas that are offered for workers and, and also investment visas. What, what, what the types of investment visas that are going to be for business in the U.S. that can be that are offered also? Yes. So the good news, uh, I hate to be the bearer of all bad news. Um, the good news is a lot of people are now saying, um, can you all hear me? Is this on? Very well. Okay. <laughs> so the good news is, um, a lot of H-1Bs and a lot of people from overseas are now saying that we want um, either an investor visa or we want what's called an EB-5, um, which leads to a green card. And the great thing about EB-5s, I mean, these people, you know, generally have assets of over a million dollars to invest into the U.S. economy. They have to have at least 10, um, you know, people that they're hiring at minimum, 10 to 20, and they're, they're building businesses in this country. So with the stop of the, well, with the increased restrictions on H-1B, a lot of people are now coming to our offices and saying we want to invest. Um, so they love Austin. They love Texas. You know, like I said, Austin with the technology. Um, China is a big one, and you've probably seen this a lot, um, of wanting to bring, you know, tech companies here, or even they're looking at real estate investments um, type companies and things like that. So. They're wanting to come here and put their money in and, and potentially get to that level because nobody wants to go through the H-1B like, process anymore. So that is good news. I mean, these are the higher end clients. They obviously have the money and they, they want to build up. And they are going to add to the economy because they are building businesses and potentially bring it in outside workers to come and work in their companies to Austin. Okay. Thank you, Bruja. Thank let's, you. Let's, let's talk to Mitch now. So Mitch, you cannot. So, the famous notarios publicos, no? So foreign purchasers from civil co-jurisdictions must utilize notarios publicos, like in Mexico and other uh, uh, Latin American countries. So for the establishment of property rights, uh, conveyances, conveyances, fiscal responsibilities. So how is it different in the United States? Well, the concept of title insurance is 150 years old in our country. The first title company came into existence in Pennsylvania within the first 100 years of our inception, which is pretty surprising, pretty amazing when you think about it. What I learned when I got in, as a, even though I'm a Texas broker, what I learned when I got into the international arena, this concept does not exist in any other single country in the world. Why is that? We created this concept and yet it never got exported outside of our borders. Why? Because in all of these other countries, they have a reliance in civil code jurisdictions, as Luis said, on notarios publicos, public notaries who are some of the highest attorneys in the land. They are the cradle to grave operation like a title company is. And then in common law jurisdictions, you have a reliance on solicitors. So there's a reliance on attorneys to provide this cradle-to-grave operation. They are not only judicially responsible for the establishment of real property rights, but they are also fiscally responsible. What does that mean? We as realtors rely on a title company to receipt the contract, to receipt earnest money, to be able to have the documents prepared, to create the consummation of the transaction between buyer and seller, to record the deed, and at the end of the day, the biggest benefit that we as purchasers, which is the law here in Texas, that a seller must provide an owner's policy of title insurance to the purchaser, is this contract of indemnity known as the title policy. Title policies don't exist anywhere else in the world, which is, was phenomenal to me. So part of our initiative was to create this awareness of what a title policy did for the benefit of purchasers of real estate. Still, it's very difficult. It's still an uphill battle. But slowly, countries have looked at the concept. Canada, for example, they're using solicitors to handle their transactions, and particularly from the mortgage industry. The Canadian market is prolific, as, as Dr. Torres said, about them looking at their acquisition of real estate in our country. But they have a reliance on solicitors for the establishment of their real property rights. 
Finally, they started looking at, in the mortgage se sector, the benefit that a title policy provided. The solicitor said, you know what? This liability that we've had inherent to our transactional process, we can now lay off to a, co a company, a title company, that has life in perpetuity. And so as a result, the Canadian operation has really flourished. So it's a change. Your buyers that are coming from other countries don't understand what a title company does. And so it's incumbent upon us as realtors to help educate this is going to be who's going to handle your transaction and ultimately also protect you in the acquisition of that real estate. I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> uh, thank you for the great answer. I was actually going to ask you, I think you answered my second question, it was going to be foreign nationals uh, purchasing real estate in the U.S. are not accustomed to that, to the title company. So what do they do and what their role responsibilities in transaction? Mm -hmm. no? you cannot. Well, again, I think the biggest difference is it is very di difficult to change norms of business. Notarios have been around for hundreds of years. When you start looking at economy, we're a fledgling nation at 200 and some odd years, okay? You start, when we went into England and, and to Great Britain, and we started looking at the public registries, and the Brits would tell us, we have title insurance, y'all are, are a new nation. We've, we've had the land registry system in here and relying on our attorneys for a thousand years. Think about going to Italy. Think about going to Brazil. Think about going to France. You know, you go into these countries and they've been doing real estate transactions for a thousand years. So they've had a reliance on how they transact real estate and do business. But at the end of the day, what happens if a purchaser suffers a loss due to a defect in title? What is their recourse? They have to sue the seller. You do not sue notaries. You do not sue uh, solicitors in these countries. Even though you suffered a loss, your only recourse is to sue the seller in that particular jurisdiction. And at the end of the day, you're going to be there for a long time. So this is why the concept of title insurance is gaining traction, to be able to provide that indemnification, protecting a buyer's rights in the event of a defect in title. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. So now let's, let's talk about, let's ask Bill some interesting questions. So, Bill, what's the difference between an inbound and outbound foreign transaction? Mm -hmm. First of all, I also want to say thank you for having us here today. We're really uh, enjoying being a part of this uh, global day at the Austin Board of Realtors. Um, so foreign transactions are generally categorized into one of two categories, inbound or outbound. Uh, inbound referring to foreign investors, foreign business people who are wanting to come to the United States and do business, make investments in real estate, um, any type of transaction that's from someone who's not a U.S. citizen. Uh, outbound transactions describe more U.S. citizens who want to go buy real estate in foreign countries, foreign businesses, that sort of thing. So it's, it's those are two, the two broad categories in, in, uh, with regard to the foreign transactions. So Bill, so let's say that that, that person moves here and they still, they're still paying taxes, you know, in, in their, their country of origin. Can they Credit those tax, taxes against U.S. Uh, income tax? Let's say they move here, they got a new job here, still paying taxes in Mexico, Canada, or India, or France. Can they credit that to their income tax here in the U.S.? Um, that's uh, Generally speaking, you can take a, a credit for foreign taxes that are paid uh, if you're, certainly it's if you're an American citizen. Um, foreign citizens have a little bit different rules in that if, if they do move, actually move here, then they become residents, then they become liable to file tax returns, just like a U.S. citizen does, um, given certain uh, requirements with regard to physical presence in the United States, um, obtain, obtaining a green card, for example. Um, so in those situations, um, if, they're paying, if they're paying taxes on basically the same income, um, and, and I will, I will just go on to, to mention that the United States is one of the few countries in the world that are left that will tax its citizens on their worldwide income. Most foreign countries have what's known as a territorial regime. 
yes, there are there are some credits that are that are allowed. So that you're the the idea being that you're not being taxed on the same income twice. Just just one question I found interesting that uh, should direct investment by foreigners uh, be avoided in the U.S. Direct investment should not be avoided in, by foreign investors in the United States. Um, however, it great care should be given as to the, the form of investment and the type of investment. Foreign investors have a, uh, a real disadvantage over American citizens in the sense that the estate tax um, exemption is very low for foreign investors as individuals. So it's, it's roughly $60,000. Meaning that if someone came here and, and made a large investment and they pass away, then, then they're, st they're subject to estate tax once you exceed $60,000 of, of assets. Um, and so that, that can be very problematic. What the, a better result would be, or a better um, situation would be for a foreign investor, and this is typically what occurs, to form a corporation and invest at the corporate level. Then they're, then they're able to uh, eliminate themselves from a potential estate tax problem down the road. Thank you, Bill. Now going back to David. So you kind of mentioned the, the trends uh, international business interests, if international business interests in here in the city of Austin. So what role does global, global partners play in the coming years to develop international connections? And what does it mean to the uh, residents of Austin? So I think we're at uh, a very unique intersection, you could say right now in the world as far as global expansion and global trade is concerned. Uh, I mean, there are obviously are some upcoming difficulties when you're looking at NAFTA and things along those lines, but there's still, like I said, there is this huge amount of attention that's coming into Austin from international markets. I mean, they're looking at, they're looking at mainly tech, but the medical scene here with Dell Medical School and the Merck showing up is a huge side. Uh, we're constantly expanding into our creative sector, and that's what Austin's known, it was built off creatives, and it still very much is a creative city. <laughs> And that is still known. I mean, we are, we're sending a delegation to India that's focused all around the creative world in September because of the amount of expansion. Uh, and it's different because borders are becoming less and less, and it's being connected more through communication and technology around. So, I mean, you look at things like Rocket Mortgage, they're going to be, I mean, you're doing a transaction on your phone to purchase a house in international markets is their eventual goal. Yeah. Uh, so you see stuff like that happening. And, and you know that it's, it's coming, it's around the corner. Globalization is it's the way it's going, and it's something that we need to find a way to align ourselves with in order to really take advantage of it and grow Austin in the right way while we still have a hand on the wheel. Have you heard any, you know, because of maybe an image issue or negative comments from foreigners that maybe they're afraid of NAFTA not going through, and they're like, oh, we're gonna stop that investment because NAFTA's not going through, or the tariffs issues, or we're afraid that this is gonna happen, have you, or maybe even immigration, like, you know, have you heard any? A, a little, so, well, I mean, look, so like Mexico's a great example, right? So they used to do a lot of their corn imports would come from the Midwest. They just switched to finding a new partner. They increased, well, like 970% <laughs> increase of imports in corn came from Brazil this past year. Those are real world implications that are happening out of the fear of the NAFTA talks. In Austin, I haven't seen much of that. Uh, people obviously are weary. Actually, the Greater Hispanic Chamber of Commerce right now is on a delegation in Mexico to kind of get a feel for what, what the economic prosperity and the futures are looking like. People are worried, of course, but it's not, I think they're looking at a longer timeline. And we know that the damages or whatever might be being done with negotiations and the fears that are happening, they'll be able to be recovered from. It's just a matter of what does that timeline look like until we can kind of get there and the fears that are happening in between. Business finds a way to succeed. It's the uncertainty that is the killer of it right now. Yeah, yeah, major issues in uncertainty mm -hmm. being created. Like a, I think somebody said, we're putting a monkey wrench. You know, it's a beautiful, <laughs> it was a beautiful, um, we machine, right, functioning machine, and now we put like a monkey wrench, and yeah, it's gonna, mm -hmm. you create that uncertainty definitely. Uh, Puja, so go about, talking about more about you know uh, home purchases by foreigners. So, can any foreigner purchase a home in the U.S.? Uh, and, and are there any immigration benefits of a foreigner purchasing a a, a home here in the U.S.? Yes, um, anyone can purchase a home, even undocumented. They go through the ITIN process, which I know I think that you guys can explain a little bit better, but um, you know, um, anyone can purchase a home. And in fact, you know, at least from the undocumented population, uh, studies have come out that um, over $1.6 billion is paid in taxes um, in the state of Texas 
from the undocumented. So yes, anyone can purchase a home. Um, it is, you know, a lot of the, as I mentioned before, a lot of the H-1Bs, um, you know, people who don't have these permanent visas, like the green card holders and citizens, obviously, or naturalized citizens, um, they are more wary of purchasing homes these days because they're, they feel very unstable. They don't know where they're going to be. Um, H-1Bs, like they, they do have to renew their, their um, you know, their visas, they, you know, they're traveling, they have travel issues these days, and they could get denied upon renewal. So, yes, they can purchase a home. Um, if you do have someone who purchases a home, I'm sure a question might come up these days of what happens if I have to leave the country. Unfortunately, having a home in this country does not help you with the visa process. It does not guarantee you a visa. It doesn't make it any easier. Um, but, you know, they can have it for investment. So, you know, purchase a home, um, but know that you're going to have some, some clients who, you know, if they're H-1B or L-1 or any of these business visas or undocumented, they are going to be more fearful um, under the climate just because I think there is a lot of fear mongering and, um, you know, the news that's coming out. So there is a lot more fear. And so I think there's a lot more placating with the clients of what would happen if they purchase a home. And I would focus more on you know, the investment value of doing this. They are also seeing that um, if you do get deported and you don't make your payments, I mean, it gets foreclosed upon like any other home. I mean, the home is here, people are overseas. Um, foreclosures might happen, they may not be able to find the people that are now deported. So it, it will affect the economy. For green card holders, um, legal permanent residents, one thing that would be great is um, you know, they have residents here, you know, and what's good is if they want to apply for citizenship and they travel a lot, what they always look for is one of the bases is, do you have a residence in this country? Are you maintaining it? Are you, um, you know, do you have people who live there? Are you paying utility bills? So when you do eventually apply for citizenship after five years of getting your green card, um, owning a home does help in that citizenship process, especially if you do travel a lot for work, which a lot of us do lately overseas or um, have family overseas, having that home here is great for that purpose. So that is something that I would tell my client if they were asking how would this help me um, later on. Yeah. The other thing I was going to ask you, I heard this story that, uh, especially with the case of Houston, you know, some people come visit their families, right, maybe from China, from India, from Mexico, and they're here and they, they see their, their family and they like, they, like, they like the school district, they like the, have the where they live, et cetera, et cetera. And they're like, ah, why don't we move here, right? Why don't we, I, I want, let's move here from Mexico City, from Delhi, from Beijing, let's move to Houston or Austin. And what they do is they, they kind of make a mistake, right? They, they, they leave their kids there, they buy the house. Oh, let's buy the house, let's leave the kids there. I'll go back and then I'll apply. Mm -hmm. So that would be an uh, incorrect step to do, right? It, you should actually go back, apply, and then move, purchase the house, et cetera, et cetera. No? Am I right or wrong? Or? Well, it just depends. So a little personal story about myself. Um, my father um, worked for an American oil company, Aramco, um, overseas, but he bought a house. I mean, he was a green card holder at the time, but he bought a house for the purpose of, I'm eventually going to move to the United States, and I, you know, housing prices are going up, so I'm going to buy, I'm going to rent it out, and eventually. So I think it just depends on you know, what visa they're looking for. Yeah, maybe it's a tourist visa, visa, right? You're coming in a tourist visa. Well, a tourist visa, yes. It is very risky to just say, I'm going to come and buy a house. I mean, I, I think that's the same with any country, not just the United States. I mean, any place that you go, any country you go and just buy a house, there's no guarantee that you can just live there indefinitely or become a resident. And it's not going to help you with your visa application. In fact, for a tourist visa, if you do buy a house, you know, one of the intentions of a tourist visa is I don't want to reside or settle in the United States, and you are telling the consulate that. So if you have a house, it might be a little contradictory to what your intentions are, and that would actually work against you. Okay. So. Just one other question. Let's say somebody gets deported and they have they own a house. What would happen? Would that house be sale? Could they sell it off? Would the government sell it? Or what would happen to that property? I mean, the owner could sell it before deportation, or they can keep paying mortgage payments and hold on to it for investment purposes, or have family and friends manage it, or it could just get foreclosed upon. Um, there's no guarantee that they can come back into the country and actually take care of their home. So okay. it's just a piece of property in this land at that point that 
they have no right, they, ha they have no immigration visa right to come see it. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you. So Mitch, how does the cost of a typical residential transaction in Texas differ from other countries? Ooh. <laughs> $64 question, by the way. Okay, so we're accustomed to having low transactional cost, typically here in Texas and around the country. Um, and my title company associates could tell you that, you know, generally speaking, it's going to be about 1% to 2%, not concluding commissions, but all in to work with a title company that's going to handle the transaction, okay? I'll use Mexico as an example. Whether you're a Mexican national, well, let's, let's use us as Americans purchasing in, in Mexico. So we identify the property. The first thing we've got to obtain, because we are foreign nationals and not Mexican nationals, is we've got to obtain a trust permit. I'm talking about residential properties located in the restricted zone of Mexico. Okay, and I don't want to get off because I can lose y'all real fast in, in all of this. It's not the same when you're buying a beach front property or something along the border versus buying in Mexico City or San Miguel de Allende because that's in the interior and they're not located in the restricted zone. So when you're buying beachfront properties that are in the restricted zone as defined, and that's all of the beaches in Mexico, all the coastline, all of the border within 62 miles of the United States, you have to have a foreign trust permit. You have to establish what is known as a fideicomiso, a bank trust. The transfer tax on these transactions at the outset paid to the federal government of Mexico is 2% of the transaction value, what we call the declared value. You have to pay the notary fees, okay, because the buyer pays for everything. So when you go to Mexico to purchase a residence, you're going to be responsible for the transfer tax at 2% of the declared value, the notary fees, the trust registration, trust acceptance, the closing costs, and generally speaking, that's going to be about 6 to 8%. So compare that to the United States at 1% to 2%. So you can see the difference in the transactional level. That's why foreign purchasers coming here and they look at it because they're still responsible for a 2% transfer tax. They're still responsible as nationals to pay for the notary fees, the transactional costs, the recordation, preparation of the documents. So their transactional cost by comparison in their country to Texas is a lot more expensive. So, but when you go and now because of the concept of the bank trust, it actually increases that cost by probably two to three percent for foreign purchasers in these jurisdictions. All these countries have a transfer tax. All of these countries have notary fees. They all have recording costs and document preparation. So when you're transacting international real estate as a foreign national, it's going to be more expensive. Thank you, Mitch. I was going to ask you, actually, the tax implications and subsequent crossing costs. Well, as, as we just said, yeah. so yeah, purchasing right. residential real estate in the restricted zone, just figure it's going to be 6 to six to 8 percent about. Depends on what the value of the, of the asset. Just think about it. If I'm buying a $200,000 residence versus a million, think about the transfer tax implication alone, right? It just went up exponentially as a result of that 2%. And that's non-negotiable. That's paid to the federal government of Mexico. Okay? Um, back to your question, Luis, in, in terms of the, I think, and I, and I lost sight of one of the, the points that you made. Tax implications. And ah, costs. big tax. Okay, here's the biggest. You go down and you buy a residence in Mexico. You pay $100,000 for it. You decide to sell that residence in Mexico. What is the capital gains implication? All of these countries have capital gains taxes. Okay? In Mexico today, the capital gains tax is 33% of the gain. So what that means is you bought it for 100, 
you've had an appreciation in these properties, which was going on like crazy from 1998 to 2008. And let's say that the, you sell a property for 100,000. Your gain, I mean, for 200,000, your gain's 100,000. 33,000 of that gain just went to the federal government of Mexico. The additional 67,000 that you bring back to the United States, as Bill said, <laughs> is a foreign tax credit. There is no double taxation, as Bill said. So you still get to keep that gain, but a lot of people go, oh my God, is 33% capital gains on the sale of the real estate? Hey, you just made 67,000 on the acquisition, which is not taxed again. But that capital gains tax is real. The other caveat about this is you always would want to make sure that the declared value in the Escritura Pública, the public deed, is what you paid for the property and not some lower value. Because if it's a lower value, when the notary goes to estimate the capital gains tax, he's going to look at what's stated in the deed, and there are other ramifications to that. But if it says you paid 50000 and you actually paid 100000 and then you sell it, you just gained another 50000 of tax liability. So caveat M tour, right? Buyer beware. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mitch. So, Bill, you were talking about real estate. Are there special rules for foreign investment in real estate transactions? If so, how do they factor in the tax calculation for foreign transactions? There are special rules um, for investing in, in real estate by foreigners, um, and, and they're somewhat complex. Um, but in, in one instance, for example, um, you will be taxed on your gross income without deductions. Um, in another instance, you can make a net election uh, and be taxed at the net level after deductions. So it's very important in how these things get structured. Um, in addition to that, if, if you have a business that, is, that can generate what is called effectively connected income, then you're going to automatically being, be paying tax on the net income as opposed to the gross. So um, one of the things I think it's very important to just to stress here is that uh, if you're going to have a client who's going to be investing in foreign real estate or foreign investors investing here, please put them in touch with some professional, a professional team to work through a lot of these issues ahead of time because many times these issues do need to be worked out in advance. Sometimes after the fact, it's too late and can, can be very costly. Thank you, Bill. And one last question. Is there a tax withholding requirement on certain foreign transactions? There is a tax withholding requirement. Um, and typically, it's done at the title company. For many real estate tax uh, transactions, there's a 30% withholding tax um, that gets credited to the taxpayer. Um, it's similar to other withholding if, if you have you know, salary that where you're subject to withholding or any other type of of uh, estimated tax payments, but um, typically a 30% withholding tax, and then there's additional, um, and depending upon the type of transaction it is, there may be it may be subject to a 15% withholding tax. So there's there's a number of different um, withholding rates. Also, I will mention too that um, we have about currently 67 tax treaties with other countries. And it's very important to know that because if you're dealing with a country where we have a tax treaty, the tax treaty is going to take precedence over the default Internal Revenue Code. So the tax treaty comes into play first if there is one with, a, with that country and that citizens from that country. One of the things that the bill just alluded to, this additional 15 percent tax is covered under what we call FERPTA, the Foreign investment real property tax act as a title company we are obligated that if this seller this foreign national seller of this realty does not have a social security card we have to automatically remit 15 percent to the irs so as realtors when you're dealing with a foreign purchaser you need to know whether or not they have a social security number because in that transaction if they don't that 15% is going to be remitted. And it becomes incumbent upon the seller to work it out with the IRS, correct? Yes. So for the purpose of that withholding, 
Are the UPs considered uh, foreign nationals or are they considered uh, residents? I'll let you answer that. In terms of tax withholding? Yes. I mean, they're not residents for immigration purposes, um, but they do have social security numbers, so. So they would have that 15%. Right. Yeah. <coughs> right. Thank you for that intervention. Yeah, I was going to actually, I was going to open up for questions. I believe it only applies to transactions above a certain amount anyway. There's exemptions for transactions under 300,000 on the withholding, not on paying the taxes. Right. So That's why I didn't think there was any exemption about paying the taxes. The taxes still have to be paid. Right. right. And right. there's also an exemption above half yeah. a million for So yes, let's open it up for more questions, please. So some the gentleman over there, let me. I'll, I'll, So I mean, it. I, the the question the question was what. So a lot of people don't know about Austin. So what is the city's efforts in trying to get Austin known around internationally? Is that essentially what you're asking? Okay. I mean, it's a huge effort. There is a huge international uh, population here and community that's very active. So I mean, we have. Uh, I mean, like Global Austin is a great organization that brings in delegations all the time. We have Texas International Education Consortium that does a great job internationally. Austin Sister Cities Committee, the World Affairs Council. There is a lot of international groups that are all putting efforts forward. The city side of it, we are honestly, we're limited because we are the city of Austin. We can't, I mean, we don't have the funds to just go do a nice campaign around the world, as fun as that would be. Uh, so what we have to do is we have outbound delegations, but it's all in the name of business development. From, from my standpoint, I'm, I'm economic development. My job is to increase the tax base and increase the jobs here in Austin, correct? So. We don't just necessarily get to go out and talk about Austin in like an international affairs capacity. Those are towards other organizations. So, uh, I mean, what we're doing is we're all, we, we meet all the time, uh, all these international players, and we, and we sit down and we try to develop our strategies over the years on how we can get to be known. And it's just through these small efforts that uh, people are starting to learn about us. So we did a, a, a grant-funded kind of project with uh, Pakistan. Nobody in Pakistan knew who Austin, Texas was, man. Nobody, all right? Like, you get it. <laughs> <laughs> they think we're cowboys and steak. That's it. You know, it's a, it's a different world. But so we, we start working there. We work with the entrepreneurship team. We do all these exchanges. We do all this training development. And now, I mean, I've hosted, I think, like three different delegations from Pakistan that have come here and they're talking about what they're going to do at South by Southwest in March. So it's through these small efforts. It's just kind of getting out there into the world stage that we're really starting to become that global player right now. And also those consulate offices. Those are huge help. We have uh, Ireland and Mexico here. And those stand, I mean, those are just beacons for what we can do here in Austin. And we're, there's more that are coming. Canada's moving their honorary consulate position here from Dallas right now. There's, uh, there's outreach kind of offices from the UK and stuff. Special note on the UK, actually. So there was about like 12 businesses, say, with a UK Austin connection. That direct flight opened up, and we are at 85 right now. So it's stuff like that that's also helping, is that frictionless movement. I have a comment and a question. When I took the TAR cruise for the SIPS course, and we went to Mexico three stops, they didn't know about Austin, which I found very interesting. And when I made a connection <clears throat> with the real estate folks in, the, in Mexico through the ports, I sent them the welcome uh, newcomer information from the chamber, and that tells them a lot about Austin, so that they can, um, attract buyers in their country to us. The question that I have is, if I also have Mexican citizenship and I buy property in Mexico, how does that work? With, if I buy using my Mexico passport, how does that work? You have every right as a, uh, carrying a Mexican passport 
to purchase property as a Mexican national because you carry the passport. In terms of taxes? It, not going to be any different. Again, well, the difference would be you avoid the fideicomiso, you avoid the bank trust. But all the other tax implications and closing costs are the same, whether you're a Mexican national or a foreign national. But here's the caveat. Are you married? Thankfully, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that curtailed this question. I, uh, right. Just a comment. I divorced in California and paid alimony. Okay. All right. So and, and here's the reason why I asked this question, ladies and gentlemen. Do you have children? Okay. So you've just made it, you're, this answer really simple. All right. You just made this really simple. All right. Here, here's the reason why I tongue in cheek this, this answer. When you purchase as a Mexican national under your passport, nobody else has title to that property other than you. So, well, unless you had a husband who's an American. No, I know. I understand that. You got, but what I'm saying is, let's say I'm, I'm Mexican by birthright. My mother's family is 100% Mexican. All right. So if I went in and I purchased the property under a Mexican passport as a Mexican citizen, my wife is not covered, my children are not covered, I'm the only one that has title to the property. However, if, because they're foreign nationals, if I want to do it right, we set up the bank trust, my wife and I become co-beneficiaries of the trust, and we can name our children as secondary or substitute beneficiaries, now they don't have to go probate a will in Mexico, God forbid, upon our demise. So it's, it's, that's the caveat. You can certainly buy property at, under your passport. You're not going to have to do the bank trust anywhere in Mexico, but the other taxes subject away from the fideicomiso, the bank trust, are going to be the same. But I was asking, is it U.S. taxes? Do I have to pay those? No. Well, well you get credit. Yes. You get credit. If you're taxed of it, let's say you sell the property. No, no, but if you sell the property. Okay, you're still subject to capital gains tax, whatever it gets calculated out based on your bet. But you don't get taxed again here in the United States for the money that you would bring back. Okay, great. Thank you. It gets reported on your U.S. return, right. but you get credit for the taxes that you pay in Mexico. Correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Jim Smith of the Property Management Company. If I may, a couple of distinctions. The 15% tax that you have to pay for somebody who does not have a TIN number, that's based on the gross sales price. That's not on net proceeds. That's correct. And I think it's important that people understand that. Correct. The second thing is regarding the 30% withholding, there's two other factors on there that need to be aware of. If you're doing, uh, uh, if we have uh, non-resident clients that own properties here, and that 30%, we have to withhold on gross rents as well. And that's not just the rental price, but there's any CAM charges or anything else we collect. That 30% is based on the actual total number, the gross number that we receive. And there's additional requirements on how quickly you have to turn that in based on the amount of money you receive at any specific time period. Very good. Are there ways for TREC and all of us real estate license holders to make a difference to home affordability and the supply of lots? <laughs> well, actually, no, it would be difficult because, you know, you're not a, a home builder. You know, the lots issue has a, has a, has a different problem coming from that. That's a more like structural issue, regulation, or local regulation. Uh, credit regulation, uh, Dodd-Frank affected the ability for a lot of, of, of home builders to get financing to develop lots. So it's more, you know, a structural issue from the supply side of, of, of construction. You're more on the demand side, right? So, but yeah, it's more a, a supply issue that we have, not only in Texas, but in the U.S. now. Kind of to, I mean, to address that more, like that's that's the answer to the affordability issue that cities all over the world are facing. You know, so it's a it's a difficult one, and I don't know, I don't know, no one really knows where the answer comes from for that. Hopefully, we can find it soon, though. Hi, I have a question. Um, I know a lot of people, uh, U.S. citizens, who do want to purchase properties in Mexico. Um, how do you, as a realtor here? 
how do you think we should best connect them with somebody down there, or how, how do they find that? I could almost let my buddy Ed Aiken over here answer that question. Which, and, and I personally have so, been researching it for eight years, so I know, but I want to hear what you think. Sure. Um, agents in Mexico, first and foremost, are not licensed, okay? with the exception of the state of Sonora. Sonora in, uh, incepted a, a registration act. If you decide that you're going, you've got a client here that wants to go and purchase in a retirement home, whether their favorite market of Ed Playa del Carmen, San Miguel de Allende, Los Cabos, wherever they decide that they want to go, they can work with agents. All of the major brokerage companies are in Mexico. So whether it's Realty Executive, it's Remax, it's Colwell Banker, who are they all exist. They're franchises, okay, and they're owned by the broker owner. Okay? So you would want to refer your client to an agent in that particular market that can show that, and they can work with multiple agents because they may have, you know, the exclusive right to sell agreement in Mexico is not like it is here in Texas, be aware, okay? But they are the ones that are on site that can show them various properties in that particular locale. You can be paid a referral fee, okay? Brokers in our agents, I said they're not brokers. Agents in Mexico are not accustomed to, to transacting on a 50-50 basis. So you refer a client to them, you're not going to get 50% of the commission. They'll pay you a 20% referral fee because they may, in fact, be co-brokering the, the transaction with who the listing agent is. They, again, they don't have exclusive uh, buyer transactional rights. It just, it, it's just, it's an evolution of a process. These things didn't, when I started in New Mexico in 1994, none of this existed. They didn't have, I mean, you know, <laughs> the prevailing attitude at the time, sadly, was that because they weren't licensed, if it's going to kill the deal, don't tell them. <laughs> you know, and I had agents here that said, well, well we got agents here that do that too. But the, the issue is, with this awareness that got created about the transactional process and Americans becoming much more educated about the transactional process, they had to up the ante and become much more professional and have a higher level of integrity about the transactional process. So it's been a real change beneficially for the market. But that's how, what you would want to do. Let them pick whatever market they like. You've got beach people, you've got colonial people, you've got uh, people that want to be in, in a place like Mexico City. They can go, but there are agents and brokerage companies in all of those cities that can help your client, and then you can still be compensated for that. How many of you are CIPSs? Whoa, excellent. Okay, for those of you, Certified International Property Specialist designation, as this lady correctly said, she went on the TAR cruise. We do the institute on the TAR cruise, the five days of it. It gives you the ability to network with about 3,000 real estate professionals from around the world. And I think that it's, it's beneficial. Even though I don't sell real estate because it would be a conflict of interest working for a title company, to me it was very beneficial to have the CIPS designation because of who it opened me up to. And I think it's impressive that already now there, that, there are many, that many uh, CIPS designees right here in this room. It's a small cadre of professionals, so I think it benefits people that want to work in the international arena. This gives you another avenue. Thank you. Following a little bit on her on, on her question is how much of a foreign investment are you seeing in Mexico? So why were you seeking to open a title company in Mexico? Uh, this is the seventy-four dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so why did we start in nineteen ninety-four? NAFTA and the changes in the foreign investment law that the Mexican government instituted, which were monumental and they were very significant. And this is why any one of us can go down and create a Mexican corporation and it requires no foreign participation 
And we can get fee simple title to the real estate anywhere that it's located by creating our Mexican, what we call an SRL, okay? So we saw an opportunity that foreign purchasers were going to want to buy real estate in Mexico. It took us three years to create the Mexican underwriter. So Stuart Title Guarantee the Mexico, which is who I have responsibility to, is the only Mexican title insurance underwriter owned by a U.S. parent. And the market was prolific. I mean, if you look at, at as property values increased here in the United States and people began to realize their home equity in those residents, they started saying, well, we can go and take a, a home equity loan and go buy real estate in Mexico. And so literally our business doubled every year up until, well, until 2010. After the financial crisis in 2008, the market shut down. We went from 80 to 100 escrows a month to zero, to zero. We laid off our employees in Mexico City. We laid off our entire staff, which was our escrow department, because the dynamic of the market had changed. It wasn't that, the, that the, those markets had necessarily changed, but the financial uh, disposability to make that investment changed dramatically. And as a result, you saw property values really diminish uh, in these markets. And they had a 40 and 50 percent diminishment depending upon which particular market. So at the end of the day, is it a good time to buy residential real estate in Mexico? Absolutely. Because of the fact that these values have come way down and they're beginning to appreciate in value once again. <laughs> <laughs> Photo op, boom, um, and and they really are, and they're, they're yes, ma'am. In on a limited basis, we just don't have the manpower, and so, but yes, depending upon the particular market and particular development, we have a lot of relationships down there. I mean, when you go from doing a thousand title policies a year to twenty-five, it's it's hard to maintain that. But the values have really come, really come back. Again, you need to look at the particular market that you like and work with them, but those values have come down. The affordability is very good. Unfortunately, there's no financing. These are still cash-driven markets, and you'd have to be very careful about doing seller financing from a developer or from a current owner of a property and being able to secure title to it. Because typically, they don't transfer the title when you do a seller finance transaction, whether it's from the developer or the current owner of the property. But it's coming back, and I think it's going to continue to increase. You had a question, didn't you? Yes, I have a question about um, the city of Austin. Yeah. Um, what is the situation there? When somebody, the city of Austin, when somebody buys a lot, what is Austin doing to make it more pleasurable to buy something in the city of Austin? There's so many restrictions, utility laws, yeah, yeah. taxes. Yeah, the list will keep going. It's all right. Yeah. We've got a et cetera, while. Et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> anyway, as economic development, is anything happening on your end to try to help that? This really is not a question that I am anywhere qualified to answer, unfortunately. Uh, the world that I see is economic development on an international level. It's not the real estate area. I don't deal with Austin, so uh, I can refer you to some people who might be able to give you some guidance, but that is the best that I can do for you. Yeah. But yeah, home, home builders complain a lot about that, by the way. So we, we hear the home builders saying, you know, those issues you mentioned, yeah. regulation and taxes, and that's one of the reasons why it's affecting the, 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 the construction of new homes in the state of Texas. As you know, before what happened, you know, demand would increase by 100 houses, the builders would, would build 100 houses. But that does not happen anymore, right? And one of the reasons why they point towards is regulation at the, at the local level. <laughs> Hey, Francis Moreno with Magnolia Realty. I wanted to ask, is there a minimum, is, and this is a legal slash CPA question, <laughs> is there a legal amount of real estate that a foreigner can purchase in the United States of America that 
guarantees and or protects opportunity for citizenship. As in, can you hear me? As in, if they buy a certain amount, can they guarantee citizenship? Yeah, if they own a million dollars of real estate in the United States, or is there any kind of... Not just buying real estate will guarantee citizenship, um, nor will it guarantee a green card or any other visa. If they start a business and, and put a million dollars into the business, and we do have a current client who is doing a real estate um, management company of a million dollars and hiring more than you know 10 citizens and uh, moving forward on that end with the business plan that's an option but just straight out buying real estate of a million dollars will not get any thank you for clarifying sure I have a, a sort of a three-part question. Uh, number one, it is my understanding that most EB-5, um, I guess, investors don't actually start a business but invest into a pre-structured business. That's number one. Uh, number two, I read that apparently the spouses of HB-1 visa holders are not going to be allowed to work, have work permit, um, in the U.S., I don't know if that's a rumor or that's something that has already been decided and has a date on it. And number three, what would the impact of that be on the real estate market since most of those families are relying on two incomes to purchase and, you know, the real estate that they own in the U.S.? Good question. Um, so there's three parts to that. So first of all, um, the EB-5, yes, there are two ways to go about it. There are EB-5 regional centers um, that you can refer clients to from overseas, and they do have predetermined um, businesses that you can invest, and they kind of help you move forward with that, or they can do it on their own. Um, be careful, you know, if anybody wants to come talk to me, I do have some regional centers that we personally work with that are good. Um, there are some that you know, there, you have to be wary of. So um, I, w I would be careful with just, you know, referring to any regional center because some of them, I don't want to say scam, scammers. <laughs> um, they're, they're just not as legit as others. Um, yes, it is a rumor about the, so it's called H4 EAD. So an H1B client um, who is working in this country you know, their wives are called H-4s, um, and they're basically derivatives of the H-1B. They are not allowed to work until the H-1B's were, um, employer applies for what's called an I-140, which is, you know, moving forward with the green card, green card process. So that in itself takes a few years. Um, once they do that, you can apply for what's called the H-4 EAD, which gives that wife employment authorization. Um, it's a rumor they're going to take it away. I don't think that H-4 EADs, frankly, personally, are on the chopping block at this time because H-1Bs do add a lot to this country in terms of economic growth. And if we start seeing the H-1Bs, frankly, leave the country and start going back home, you know, to wherever they came from to work there, you know, this country is going to lose a lot, a lot of money. So I don't think, personally, that that is going to be, you know, anytime soon unless, I mean, who knows? Half of my work lately is reading a Twitter account, so I, I have no idea. But I personally don't think, don't think so. So, just one last thing. There's going to be a, a, a drawing. Yeah. So one last prize before the ending. But yeah, but I got yeah. it right here. Oh, you have it right there. Oh, cool. Sorry about that. <laughs> So, um, so we're going to have an uh, opportunity after lunch. We're going to enter into roundtable sessions, and there will be plenty of opportunities there for more questions for the panel. So uh, first I want to thank Dr. Torres and the entire panel. Very informative. Let's give them a round of applause. I think you can see how important it is to stay abreast on all things global, especially how it relates to Austin and Central Texas. So thank you again for your time and, and helping us out with this important issue.